funds. Um, so I'm going to leave a card at the tables uh, when I finish introducing Michael. And I'd be grateful if anybody is interested in donating some funds to help alleviate the costs of this event or others, I'd be grateful for, um, for your contribution. And if anybody would like to have more information about what we're doing, I'd be happy to uh, share that with you as well. Or you can speak to my colleague Jenny, who's waving in the back. She's the coordinator of this gap, and um, she'd also be happy to speak with you. <coughs> and also, we have uh, books on sale. A special price at Amazon, there's $25, but here, special, they're $10. Um, and Michael will be happy to sign it if you're interested. And in five years, the signature will already be worth <laughs> <laughs> So uh, today, so, and, and the, the book here, as you can see from Simon & Schuster, is called Battle for Our Minds, Western Elites and the Terror Threat. And I read the book uh, almost a year ago now, and nine months ago. It's a very important book. It's really, there are things happening uh, in our societies, in our institutions, um, that we really need to understand. Excuse and me, do you accept charge cards? No, we don't. Oh, maybe we do. Genuinely. Okay. Um, so it's a very important book. I urge you to read it. So it's an honor to have uh, Professor Michael Widlanski here with us. He's currently the Schusterman Visiting Professor at UC Irvine in California. He served as an advisor to the Israeli negotiating team, teams for various negotiations, including Madrid and Jordan and other places. And he worked with the Strategic Affairs, uh, and he was a Strategic Affairs Advisor for Israel's Ministry of Public Security. He has five degrees from Columbia University, the American University in Cairo, and Bar Ilan University, and he's the author of this very important book, Battle of Our Minds, Western Elites and the Terror Threat. Dr. Widlanski currently teaches at Bar Ilan University. He taught as well at Hebrew University for over two, two decades. He was a visiting professor as well at Washington University in St. Louis. He taught at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and was a research fellow at the Shalem Center in Jerusalem. Uh, Michael has also been a reporter for the New York Times, the New York Daily News, the New York Post, the Aretz, the uh, Jerusalem Post, the National Review, and the, he wrote for the New Republic. And he was the Middle East correspondent, uh, correspondent for the Cox News Agency, and was a dipl diplomatic correspondent of Arab Affairs um, for Cox and for the Israeli television and Israeli Army Radio. So it's a pleasure to have you here today. You may not like what I say, so uh, especially the optimists. Uh, but the most important thing is uh, to tell you the truth. And as soon as I find my lecture, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> I could probably do it by heart, but it's more fun. It's more fun to look occasionally at the notes. How do I get out of this? Just a second. Oh, this is Okay, that's the one. Thank you. I don't really need it, but just, it's like a crutch. It's my heroin habit. Every once in a while, I gotta get into it. basic question. What is terror? What is intelligence? And how are they connected? The most important thing to understand about terrorism is that the terrorist is not like the typical enemy. And 
terrorism is not like the typical form of warfare. In warfare, you're usually dealing with troops, with planes, with tanks, with the seizure of territory. When you're dealing with a terrorist, the terrorist is not interested in seizing territory. He's interested in seizing one thing. The terrorist is interested in seizing one thing. He's not interested in territory. I guess I should take the mic and do one of these Perry Como Frank Sinatra. <coughs> He's interested in seizing the territory between your ears. Once the terrorist can seize that territory, he's won. She's won. They've won. Because when you seize the territory between the ears, you literally can lead somebody by the nose. The terrorist wants to induce a state of panic, confusion, and fear. I used to say it was like watching an Alfred Hitchcock movie. But today, when I say that, most people give me a blank stare and they say, who's Alfred Hitchcock? But some of you may still remember. The idea of the terrorist is not so much to induce casualties, to cause casualties, but to turn the entire society into a casualty. Basically, to take a democratic society, build on its fears and its weakness, destroy its faith in government, turn a government's policies around, or even to upend the entire society. That's why terrorism is the worst kind of crime. It is not like boosting somebody's car. It's not even like murdering a person, or even mass murder, because it is eventually interested in murdering an entire society. And that is why, when you're dealing with an Osama bin Laden, or a Hamas, or a Hezbollah, you don't play by the same rules that you use when you're fighting a kid who's 16, year old, 16 years old and is trying to steal a Corvette Stingray. It's not enough to capture one of them and then put him on trial. It's critically important to capture them before they do what they intend to do. That's why the legalistic approach of a lot of politicians is wrong. That's why in Israel we do not have that legalistic approach. We do, not, we do not care about being politically correct. We make mistakes, and we have made mistakes, and we've made some recently, releasing terrorists. But generally speaking, Israel has the best record in the world in fighting terror. And countries that fight terror, which are democratic countries, Israel, the United States, France, Britain, Germany, India, Argentina. Any country that fights terror has to ally itself with other countries that fight terror. Because ultimately you're fighting a battle against the worst enemy on the planet. There's a whole other lecture that I give about the subject of why tyrants and terrorists tend to single out democratic countries, democratic societies, particularly Jews and Americans, Israel and America. I won't do that today. I'll do that some other time. But I want you to understand something. The terrorist thrives on finding the weakness in the democratic society. And the way to defeat the terrorist is to do to him or her what they are trying to do to us. Get into their heads. You cannot let them into that space between your ears. You have to be in that space between theirs. That means you have to have intelligence, as we say in Hebrew, in both senses of the word. You have to be smart. And you have to be fast. Growing up in New York City, we used to say population was divided into two people, two kinds of people, the quick and the dead. That's the same thing with terrorists. Either you're aware and quick, 
or you can be dead, and your society can be dead. What happened on 9-11 was inexcusable. We had warnings. What happened to the World Trade Center in 1993 was also inexcusable. We had advance warning. We had evidence. We had 15 cartons of evidence that the FBI didn't bother looking at. Fort Hood could have been prevented easily. The Boston Marathon Massacre could have been prevented. So how is it that America's intelligence is so often asleep? How is it that we get things wrong about the Middle East all the time? How is it that we believe in mirages like Arab Spring, Arab moderation, and Islamic democracy? How is it that President Barack Obama and the Director of National Intelligence Lieutenant General James Clapper, who used to be the head of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency where I lectured, how is it that they seem to believe in the moderation of Syria, Bashar Assad, the moderation of Iran, the Ayatollahs, and, God help us, the Muslim Brotherhood? Jama'iyat al Ikhwan al Muslimun, the Society of the Muslim Brothers which is basically a throwback to the Wahhabi doctrines that came out of the Najd Plateau in Saudi Arabia two or three hundred years ago. How can they think that these people are <coughs> moderate? James Clapper appearing before Congress in 2011 was asked about the Muslim Brotherhood and he said with a straight face, I'm not making this up, you can't make this up with a straight face. They're largely moderate, largely secular, with franchises throughout the Middle East. He was talking about McDonald's, halal branch. Really? Really? Somebody who says something like that should be summarily dismissed for terminal stupidity. And he's not the only one. So where do you get this kind of stuff from? How could anybody think that you send an ambassador to Bashar Assad and he's going to be a nice guy? Or that if you don't criticize the Iranian regime mowing down people in the streets of Tehran in a phony election, that they're going to be more moderate, they're going to be engaged. And how does somebody think that if you talk too much to Israel, they'll get upset in Syria or in Iran? or someplace else, and they won't want to talk to you as President of the United States. Well, this is a prejudice that's based on a variety of things. Arabism, Islamophilia, and good old-fashioned Jew hatred, which we sometimes call anti-Semitism. This sentiment, I hope that I have to stand right behind this. Is it all right if I take out the microphone work? Yes. No, I can't pick up the microphone. All right, then I'll stick to the microphone. These sentiments are not the special preserve of the left in the United States. They also exist on the right. They are not the special preserve of the secular humanists. They also exist among <coughs> devout Christians, even some others, other groups. They appear across the political and religious spectrum, the cultural spectrum. In the 1930s through the 1950s, most of the people who had the Arabist caste believing in the virtues of the Arab world were usually tied to the oil industry. Often they were the sons or <coughs> they themselves missionaries to Lebanon and Syria. These missionaries were very important in the setting up the ideas of Arab nationalism, Wataniya, the nationalism of the homeland, or Kaumiya, the nationalism of the Kaum, the community, based on language. And sometimes these officials or these people in oil companies or in the State Department believed, sincerely believed, 
that America's ties to the Arab community, to the oil under the sand of Arabia, would be lost if America supported the idea of Jewish statehood, or if there were Jews that worked in the State Department, all kinds of things like that. Often, however, these Arabists, and I myself am an Arabist. I studied Arabic for over 30 years. I've lived in many Arab countries. But some of these Arabists had little or no Arabic. Few, few of them actually could read Arabic. Few of them actually knew Arab culture. Few did, but most did not. And they were overly optimistic when it came to Arab attitudes. If you want a good picture of this, think of Peter O'Toole as Lawrence of Arabia. You get on a horse, you throw the kerchief around your head, and you da 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 da, you go off and have tea next to the camel. I think there was an American country singer who once had a song called Midnight at the Oasis. Think about that. Midnight at the Oasis. In recent years, these ideas of Arabism and Islamophilia and genteel and not so gentle anti Semitism became the preserve more of the American left and intellects on the left of center, such as Edward Said. Edward Said was the man who dumbed down American intelligence more than anybody else. He died on a September day, two years after the 9-11 attacks he helped make possible. And exactly on the anniversary of 9-11, the Middle East Studies Association of the United States of America offered its first Edward Said Prize in Middle East Studies to a man who didn't know Arabic. Most people don't know that, didn't know Arabic. A few words. To a man who basically took the point of view that for America and the West to know about the Middle East meant it gave them power to exploit and subjugate the Middle East. And so, in order not to subjugate the Middle East, America had to be kept in the dark, had to be kept dumb. And unfortunately, he succeeded. I went to Columbia University. I got three degrees at Columbia. I worked on the Columbia Spectator as a reporter and I was the editor of the Columbia Barnard Course Guide, which was the biggest review of courses at any American university in the United, any American university. Two or three times bigger than the Harvard Conti Guide. And we knew Edward Said. He was an English professor with a, a nationalistic Arab side to him, a protege of Lionel Trilling. And when he wrote Orientalism, the first thing I did was go to the index and go to the notes. And I discovered something very interesting, which you will not see in a New York Times book review. There is not a single source in Arabic in the entire book. Not one. Not one. And if you look through all the work that Edward Said did during his entire life, you will not find a single Arabic source cited. After he died, his wife his second wife, published an article by him posthumously with an Arabic source, and I think he probably had a lot to do with it. Yeah, right? And that was his level of Arabic. He went to study in Lebanon in the mid-1970s because he didn't know Arabic, and he wanted to know Arabic, and he didn't succeed. I sometimes make a joke which Borat picked up in his movie that he successfully taught American State Department officials because they didn't know the difference between Hamas and Hummus. <laughs> That's not true of Edward Said. He actually knew what Hummus was. But he wouldn't know how to write it. And the difference is knowing where the dots are, knowing where the diacritical marks are. By the way, you have this also in Hebrew. If you don't know the difference, you can write melech or molech. <coughs> molech is worshiping a god with human sacrifice, and melech is to be king. 
But if you don't know, you don't know. I do not agree here with Forrest Gump or some of the other Southern philosophers who said there ain't no cure for stupid. There is a cure for stupid. You can study. But in American universities, they've been studying the wrong things. And that's because of Edward Said, but not just him. Said's book, Orientalism, stigmatized the whole study of the Middle East. But he was followed by people like Noam Chomsky. He and Said were the two biggest draws in the syllabi of American universities as living authors for more than 20 years. Said and Chomsky said that America is a terrorist. Israel is a terrorist. Hamas, Hezbollah, the PLO, Iran, Saddam Hussein, they're freedom fighters. And Columbia student Barack Obama was influenced by Edward Said. There are even pictures of them dining together. And there probably would be more pictures, but some people are sitting on them, like the LA Times, which has a video of the dinner, which it's not publishing. Said used to throw rocks at America, as did Chomsky, both figuratively and literally. <coughs> These rocks landed. And the American intellectual community has been made dumber by the rocks that hit it in the head. And if you go to Georgetown University, and you see the center that's been set up by Professor John Esposito, with the help of a lot of Saudi money, where you go to other universities where money has come in from the Arab world, and a lot of money has gone to presidential libraries also, you should understand that Said and Chomsky didn't do this all by themselves. They had a lot of money coming in. And in 1978-79, when the Ayatollah Khomeini was coming back to Iran, the New York Times looked to Edward Said to tell the world that Khomeini was a moderate. And Jimmy Carter believed it. And the people around Carter believed it. Bernard Lewis took the trouble to go to the Princeton Library to look up the writings of Khomeini in Arabic. Although Khomeini wrote originally in Farsi, for Lewis it was better to go into Arabic. And he said, this guy's no moderate. The New York Times wouldn't publish his opera, but they published Edward Said. It's no accident that today's generation of American leaders, people who studied in the Ivy League, or in Georgetown. And if you're the head of the CIA, George Tenet, you studied both at Georgetown and at Columbia. <coughs> if you're Eric Holder, Barack Obama, your idea, your, your world view is formed very often in college, in graduate school. It's no accident that people like this, this generation, feel that it's more important to worry about hate crimes committed against Muslims than hate crimes committed by Muslims. Even though the US FBI reports, and I detail this in my book, for 10 years running since 9-11 show that there are six times more hate crimes against Jews than against Muslims. And there has been no spike in crimes committed against Muslims, except for that very first year. Then it came back down. And yet, Eric Holder is spending all this time looking for people who are committing hate crimes against Muslims. And that's one of the reasons that the fellow at Fort Hood was able to commit mass murder. He was acting out for a long time before that. But the army had been coached to be politically correct, to be inclusive, to be pluralistic and allow a person who, instead of giving a talk on psychiatric problems, gave a defense of istishad, committing murder in the name of God and martyrdom, as a PowerPoint presentation, who handed out cards that said, Soldier of Allah. And many people in the US Army knew about this. 
and it gets worse. The FBI knew all about this guy. They had intercepted his emails to Anwar Olaki, the recruiter for Al-Qaeda. And he was asking advice about how to commit murder and when to commit murder. And who to murder. This is detailed in a 61-page Senate report, part of which was redacted, but part of which has now come out, which talks about all of this information. And the conclusion should be that the head of the FBI should have been summarily fired. The head of the field office should have been summarily fired. The chief of staff of the U.S. Army should have been fired. George Casey. People who allow a murder to take place for reasons of political correctness cannot be law enforcement or command officers. They can't. They shouldn't. And when Time Magazine publishes a cover story with the term terrorist, question mark, over the face of Nidal Malik Hassan, they're being complicit with terror. When the New York Times publishes studies by reporters that ask the question, did the man who committed murder break under the stress of combat fatigue, they are covering up for terrorism. And the man was never in combat, and he was not in Afghanistan, and he didn't break under pressure. He was an ideological terrorist who was recruited while in a United States Army uniform. And you should know that there are thousands of people who are being recruited in United States penitentiaries, British jails, sometimes with the help of Muslim clerics. Muslim gangs, and unfortunately they have the perfect skill sets to be terrorists. They learn how to forge, they learn how to knife, they learn how to shoot, they learn how to break and enter, and they become perfect terrorists with business cards that could say, soldiers of Allah. As I said, people like Chomsky, Saeed, got a lot of help from Arab oil money, particularly from Saudi Arabia. And this money helped to undermine part of the American political establishment as well as the intellectual establishment. If you follow the careers and the money of people like Jimmy Carter, even Bill Clinton, George Herbert Walker Bush, some of the others, Many State Department officials who've served in the Arab world, and then you learn where they've gone for their pensions. It's very scary. <coughs> so has America's intelligence and its intelligentsia been influenced by anti-Semitism, Islamophilia, Arabism, and other prejudice? You bet it has. And the attitude towards Israel is particularly important because Israel is the world's front line against Arab Islamic terror and the world's best defense against Arab Islamic terror. So how do you turn an intelligence asset like that into a monster? Well, the Pollard affair is not a bad place to start. The AIPAC supposed spy scandal is not a bad place to start. Steve uh, Walt and John Mearsheimer saying that Israel is controlling American policy is not a bad place to start. This is nonsense. Uh, Mearsheimer and Wolf come from what is known as the realist school of politics. But the realist school has been watching too much reality TV. And you know what reality TV is about. It's not about reality. And unfortunately, they control a lot the journals in the American political science theater, 
in sociology. This is unfortunate, but it's also deadly. And if you're not willing to look at the people who succeeded in fighting terror and learn from them, yes, and Israel has done some things that are wrong also, but it gets most of it right. You're not going to win the war on terror, especially if you don't want to say terror, if you don't want to say war, you don't want to say Arab, you don't want to say Islamic, you don't want to say extremism. So what do you call it? Man-made potty training. I don't know what you want to call it. But you call it anything else, and then you're so surprised when you don't get it right. But if you cannot name your enemy, you cannot fight your enemy. And we can fight our enemy. And we can defeat our enemy. But if you rely on a series of people over the years who've come out of the CIA without Arabic, Without experience in the Arab world, you won't be ready. CIA agent Larry Johnson writing in the New York Times six weeks before 9-11 that people who are worried about Arab Islamic terror were fantastic, phantasmagorical dreamers. Or Paul Pilar, who wrote the National Intelligence Estimate for the CIA for years, saying that the risk of being hit by terror, he wrote a book in 2001, which was published a few weeks before 9-11, talking about the risk of being hit by terror as being the, similar to the risk of being hit by lightning or falling in the bathtub. Well, he fell in the bathtub and he hit his head, and he's still talking. Graham Fuller, CIA lead analyst on the Middle East, talking about Islamic democracy as the trend for the future. In 1992, in Algeria, before they murdered 200,000 people, most of them having their heads cut off and most of them being Muslims. A little more democracy and they won't have any hats sold in Algeria. John Brennan, the head of the CIA today, speaks Arabic badly, very badly. <laughs> He speaks Arabic, I would use one of my father's terms. Here I can't, no, I better not. It's a Yiddish term, I wouldn't, I better not use it in quotes. Brennan thinks that jihad is a spiritual journey. Anybody who knows even basic Arabic, basic Arabic, knows that jihad means war, as in Hebrew, Milchama, or in Arabic, Harb. It's the third form of the root, Jahada. And it means war. Yes, it does also mean struggle. And it's true that you can say war on poverty. You can. But in the Quran and in the Hadith, when you refer to Jihad, you're talking about war with a sword. Sabil al Sif. The path of God, God is by the sword. And even though John Esposito at Georgetown is saying that jihad is a spiritual journey, and even though Brennan spent time in Indonesia along with Obama, and they think that Indonesian Islam is very moderate, <coughs> the rest of the world takes its cue not from Jakarta, but from Mecca. And from the Arabs, jihad has a meaning. And it's not just a spiritual journey. Again, the top people in the CIA for years, Paul Pilar wrote the National Intelligence Estimate a few years in a row, Iran isn't going after a nuclear bomb, Syria can be dealt with, this is all Pilar. Michael Scheuer, the so-called hunter of bin Laden, who doesn't know that Arabic moves from right to left, who thinks that Iraq is the holiest spot in Islam. He's actually written books that say this. He doesn't know the difference between Said Qutb, Muhammad Qutb, and Osama bin Laden. I'll explain who they are. Said Qutb is the senior ideologue of the Muslim Brotherhood. Muhammad Qutb was his brother, who was actually a teacher of Osama bin Laden. These people have been leading the train 
and the train is going into the wrong tunnel. Michael Scheuer has been telling people for years that Jews are the reason for bin Laden attacking the United States, and that American Jews are like the copperheads, the treasonous people in the North who were going against Lincoln. These are the people who have been leading the CIA. They are still treated on certain campuses as sources on terrorism. You can find them listed in various terror handbooks. This is a travesty. Michael Scheuer has also appeared very often with Rand Paul, who is on the right, very isolationist and to a certain extent anti-Israel and has said that the West basically brought the attacks on itself. There's also a Secretary of State of the United States who said something similar right after 9-11 when he was still a senator. He said to a visiting Israeli official, what did we do to make them hate us so? Who was that? You know who the Secretary of State of the United States is? Which one? Mary. Oh, now, okay. Can you continue, please? Many of the best and the brightest at the CIA were lost a long time ago. <clears throat> they left in the 90s, they left in the 70s. The very best agents that used to be in the United States of America were pushed out by all kinds of political considerations. It's not an accident that the books by Michael Scheuer were not censored, whereas the books by field agents such as Robert Baer and Gary Bernson were dramatically censored. George Tenet liked Michael Scheuer. George Tenet liked Paul Pilar. George Tenet, when George Bush wanted to use a drone attack or an aerial attack to attack bin Laden and ask the CIA to do it, George Tenet said, over my dead body. These are serious problems. And when people in the CIA pretended that America's, and in the FBI, America's leaks of information were through Jonathan Pollard, when they were actually through Aldrich Ames, the Walker family, and Robert Hansen, who was the FBI's head of counterterrorism, counterintelligence, who was working for the Soviet Union. You understand how intelligence assets have been turned into monsters, and monsters have been turned into intelligence assets. Ali Muhammad, who was a bodyguard for Osama bin Laden, was teaching American troops about how to deal with Arab terrorism. You cannot make this stuff up. People would reject it as fiction because it's too outlandish. But it is what happened. And it is what's happening. The Washington Post a year ago wrote a story about the head of counterterrorism at CIA is a Muslim convert. Several CIA major field officers are converts to Islam. Can you imagine what would happen if some of the CIA's top officials all of a sudden met with a Chabad representative and said, I want to be a Chassid. What do you think would happen? What do you think would happen? So instead of dealing with witch hunts, instead of dealing with our friends as if they're our enemies, let's get smart. Let's get intelligent. Let's start educating our children in high school, not with politically correct textbooks that say everything that America's gotten that's good comes from Islam, but with real textbooks. And in college, let's start having professors who are American, who study Arabic, study Farsi, study Islam, not through the politically correct vetting of care, but through real, objective, serious study. When we do that, we'll see the enemy coming ahead of time, and we'll be able to get ready. Thank you. One of the big things I think that you that you omitted is the State Department. 
has long been anti-Semitic because the big jobs are with the many, many countries that are Arabic, uh, Arabic speaking, and they get tremendous sinecures, and therefore they have never liked Israel because Israel is a tiny country with two jobs, maybe three. So the State Department is the engine that drives, I think, a lot of this uh, mishigas. I like the term mishigas. Um, I agree with you. And I think I didn't omit it, but you're right to say that because there are so many more Arab countries, there's a built-in institutional... By the way, Henry Kissinger, to his credit, and I give him credit on this, uh, saw this prejudice and tried, when he was Secretary of State, to rotate people through Israel if they'd served in, the, in Arab countries so that they would at least get a taste of what Israel was in real life as opposed to what it was being branded throughout the Arab world. Questions? I don't have a question. I have a daddy boy. I came in 48. This is my cousin, Carol Bassley. She's American boy. I've got daddy heritage. She has done much more history. I can talk for three, four minutes about my heritage and what I know and what I tell. Speak about the things she's done. We can. But if you don't want us to do so, we don't. Because I know when there wasn't anti-Semitism, and I was born during the Fox News, which is... In 41. I was, and I have two birthdays as a result. <laughs> and our stories are, a lot of them are, I think the Far East Center, when things were good. Okay, I'll be glad to talk to you afterwards, but no, I just want to, but I want to deal, fine, be my pleasure, but I just, oh, as they, as they usually teach us speakers <laughs> to say, if you have a question, I'll be That's glad to entertain. And I don't know if you want to talk about okay. okay. uh, um, <clears throat> it. It sounded uh, pretty pessimistic, but uh, there's an optimistic side like uh, that I think um, we have to recognize also. The New York City Police Department stopped 16 Absolutely. terrorist, uh, radical Islamic terrorist attacks since 2003. Right. Uh, they you have, have you, to be given... Uh, yeah, you have a, an excellent point, which I want to, and I'm glad that you say it. <clears throat> on an operational level, law enforcement gets it. The average cop in the average city across America, whether it's in New York City, which certainly gets it, to Orange County in California, to <clears throat> the Joint Illinois-Missouri Task Force on Terror, where I spoke, they get it, they want to know, and they're interested. <clears throat> when you're dealing with the mayor's assistant, or the governor, or the president, or the attorney general, you're getting a different level. And that's why, before 9-11, we could have stopped 9-11 in several different ways. One of the ways is by interviewing people before they go on a plane. There was a rule, the U.S. Department of Transportation had a, a rule that you're not allowed to interview two people, more than two people, from the same ethnic group, otherwise it's considered profiling. So that's why they interview blue-haired old ladies and little children with walkers or whatever. Uh, and that wasn't the big conclusion of the 9-11 Commission, because one of the people who sat on the 9-11 Commission was Jamie Garlick, who was a Deputy Attorney General under the Clinton Administration, under Janet Reno, where they formed these rules. But it's, it's there. Now, if in Israel, we don't give a flying about profile. Now, our job in Israel is easier than the job in the United States, because we have a, a pretty clear monolithic danger. In the United States, you've got people with Hispanic surnames who could be Muslim terrorists. You've got people who could have learned about Islam in a British jail. You've got all kinds of people coming across the border from different directions. It's much harder. And instead of using heads-on techniques, which the NYPD does use on a federal level and often on a state level, you get people who have been coached into being kinder and gentler, <coughs> which is terrible. And I'm glad that you mentioned the NYPD. We spoke a little bit earlier, so. Uh, there's a reason the New York Times and the AP go after the NYPD, because they're so successful. 
The New York Times is not going after a mosque in Jersey City or in uh, Queens or in Brooklyn that has a history of producing terrorists. They haven't put in an undercover reporter in the mosque on 96th Street to hear what the imam says when he talks about Jews and how to deal with occupiers. And they should. Instead, the Pulitzer Prize board is giving a Pulitzer Prize to people who, writes, who write a story about how there's a nice mosque in Queens, and they don't tell you that out of that same mosque there have been terrorists. The NYPD is doing important, and your statistics are absolutely correct. They've between 12 and 16, they're different, but if you stop one major attack, you've already saved the world. 16, according to the claim. Well, they're, 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 diff they're, diff they're different stats, but some of these could have been a dirty bomb. Some of these could have been a bomb on a subway. They're major attacks. We know that some of the attacks involved uh, the Bojinka plot, a, a plot to blow up seven or eight airplanes simultaneously. There are major things that most people don't know about. When the Millennial Bomber was caught in Washington coming across the border from Canada, it wasn't because, as Richard Clark, the assistant to Bill Clinton, claimed that the Clinton administration had gotten tough on terror. It was because a border agent noticed that a man was sweating prof profusely on a summer day, wearing an overcoat, and he seemed to be hiding something. And that's what you have to be. You have to be eyeballing people. You, you know, when you come into an Israeli airport, Ben Gurion, but also in the other airports. There are several layers of security. You know why we do that? Because two pounds of TNT inside a room like this would kill 10 to 20 people. But two pounds out on the street might kill the guy who's doing the checking. Maybe not. But if you get it at the outer ring, you stop it. And we've become very good not just at offense, but also at defense. Now, you're going to get the ACLU saying, whoa, 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 we're civil liberties, blah, 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 blah. You learn to do it with tact. You learn to do it with a little sense. And you save lives. Do you know that there are more than 300 objects that are checked every week in Jerusalem, you wouldn't know it because we do it naturally. When we see a, a, a package on the street, we don't say, am I going to offend the person standing near the package if I say, excuse me, is that your gym bag? No. How long have you been standing there? I don't know. Do you know who it is? That's how we start to fight terrorism. Little common sense things. That's the important thing. So I'm going to take this later. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. I enjoyed your presentation. I'm Dr. Polner. I'm also a Columbia Honor alumni, and I've taught at Columbia. Uh, I lecture before young people on, with my film, Brave Children with Israel, and I give them talents as to how to uh, intervene when all of these hostile media and groups and so on. Uh, occur. But my question to you is, I like to know where the funding resources coming from in Saudi Arabia. When the victims of the families of 9-11 uh, pressed their case, they lost their case against Saudi Arabia. So why is it announced as to where these fundings are? What about the grants that come to these professors who go to these various Arab countries and live <coughs> like kings and queens there? Where's the information on that? Thank you very much. There have been lots of cases brought against countries under the terrorist statutes. Some have failed. A lot have succeeded, actually. Uh, victims of terror have succeeded in closing down certain things. Uh, the Attorney General of the United States of America made a decision a few months back to roll back against the indictments that were being handed down. There was a whole wave of initial indictments under the Bush administration against what was known as the Holy Land Trust, which was a kind of offshoot of Hamas. And uh, Attorney General Holder decided not to go ahead with a second wave of indictments. 
It would be interesting to ask the New York Times why it's never covered that. As for where the money's coming from, you have so much money that's rolled into the Arab world, particularly into the oil-rich countries of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, Qatar a lot, that there's no problem for somebody to give 10 or 15 or 20 million dollars, build a center at Georgetown University, or invite people to set up a Yale University uh, spot in uh, one of these countries. And then people come back and they become kind of conditioned to do a kind of uh, pro-Arab, pro-Saudi approach to politics. There is a money trail. The money was cut off in Florida at various schools because they followed the money trail. But it has to be done aggressively. The New York Times and my publisher, Simon & Schuster, published stories about the terror surveillance program and the Bush administration went to them and said, please do not do this. And they didn't do it on a partisan basis. They took the leaders of the Democratic Party the, in the House and in the Senate and they went to the publisher of the New York Times and the publisher of the New York Times said, I'm sorry uh, Simon & Schuster is publishing it. Well, of course, this was baloney. Uh, if you're a reporter for the New York Times, the information you get on the job, James Rison who did the first book on the terror surveillance program, the information you get as a reporter for the New York Times belongs to a certain extent to the New York Times. You can't write a book without the permission of the New York Times. So it was a phony argument. And yet the Bush administration got all the bad press about how it was clamping down. The surveillance program on banking was outed by the New York Times. And it wasn't a broad-based, broad-spectrum antibiotic, anybody who breathes is going to have their bank records taken, which is something like what the Obama administration has done with its, its taps on reporters, its data taps. So the press is very much an unindicted co-conspirator in helping terrorism. <clears throat> Absolutely. We have three elites that help terror in the United States. The press, academia, and government intelligence. That's what I talk about in my book. And my book barely scratches the surface. And it's just devastating. And when you have somebody in Congress, there were five Republican Congress people, uh, Gohmert and a few of the others, uh, Michelle Bachman was one of them. They treated them as if they were Joe McCarthy. Because they were talking about the fact that there were all kinds of people in the federal government who were vetting briefings to the National Security Agency, the Joint Chiefs, the State Department. I mean, Hillary Clinton's top assistant, Huma Abedin, very troubling situation. She would not have gotten by even the most basic level security clearance in, in Israel because her whole family is Muslim Brotherhood. And she is. I, 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 let me talk, please. There is a very serious problem here. And just to make fun of Gomert or Michelle Bachman, because Michelle Bachman doesn't pronounce the word chutzpah right, she says chutzpah, and David Letterman can have fun with her, or have fun with a Sarah Palin or something like that, is to be irresponsible, actually. It's really irresponsible. There are serious, serious problems of penetration of American security, and it's not by Jonathan Pollard, and it's not by APAC. I'm not a friend of Pollard, and I'm, Pollard is guilty. I'm not saying he shouldn't go to jail. But Pollard was not trying to damage the United States. <laughs> and APAC is certainly not trying to damage the United States. But you have people who are penetration agents at the highest levels who've gotten money and training from Saudi Arabia, from Iran. Let me just tell you just one story because it will blow you away. Who is the top advisor to President Barack Valerie H. Obama? Valerie Jarrett. Well, I want to see anybody else. You know. Who else knows? Valerie Jarrett, right? 
Valerie Jarrett speaks Farsi, and that's good. And she was apparently born in Iran, and that's good too. Terrific. A year and a half ago, a little less than a year and a half ago, there was an attack in Bulgaria by Hezbollah and Iran agents on an Israeli tourist group. Five people were killed in, among the Israelis and I think the bus driver. The next day at the White House there was a convocation for Iranians. The next day, many of the Iranians were not American citizens and many of them were activists and very, very pro-Ayatollah. Who spoke to them? Valerie Jarrett. And a senior White House official was quoted by the New York Times on dealing with what happened <coughs> in the Bulgaria attack done by Iran and its agents as saying, this is tit for tat for what the Israelis are doing. Meaning, the supposed attacks by Israelis against Iranian atomic scientists. Now, I don't know if that senior White House official was Valerie Jarrett or was somebody else. But the fact that any senior White House official would make that kind of comparison, make that kind of statement, and that the White House would have a convocation the next day for Iranians at the White House after an Iranian attack on an American ally? I didn't have to wait to this week to know that the U.S. isn't going to use military against Iran, Iran's bomb. I knew it. So let's wake up. Um, how do you see the role of the left in Israel uh, in terms of becoming more and more politically correct and kind of going with the flow um, and trying to appease? There's the whole IPI, of, I don't know if you're familiar with Israel, a peace initiative that's people running around to Qatar and Amman and here and there. Right. Um, there are various parts to the Israeli left. Obviously, it's not a monolithic thing. You should know that Shelley Yechimovich, the head of the Labor Party, is significantly different from some of the people who'd run the Labor Party before. She's more of a social democrat, um, uh, if you will, even social justice issue. She's been very careful not to attack uh, Israel in world forums on the issue of the Palestinians. and. She hasn't jumped down the throat of the religious or the settlers. Very interesting, her change on this. There are people who are part of the so-called peace camp in Israel who have always been trying to cover up. They cover up for the PLO. PLO is not a friend of Israel. It never has been. And there have been people in Israel who believe that the PLO would become an Israeli intelligence asset. Some of them were head of the Shin Bet. Some of them are actually assistants to Yair Lapid and his party. Nevertheless, in Israel in general today, there has been a wising up to what's going on in the Arab world. Which is one of the reasons that Shelly Yechimovich didn't use this issue in her campaign largely. But there are people who are still there. If you go to Yossi Bale and Shlomo Benami, these kinds of people, you'll have that. And there are always people on the, Israel, the far left of Israel who will go to England, go to Nottingham University or one of the other universities and publish the worst crap against Israel. And they will become the equivalent of the mashkiach kashrut. They'll give the, the, the kosher supervision insignia for somebody who wants to say the worst things about Israel. You have that all the time. And you will always have that. And they're selling. And well, I can go to all of them. The guy who used to be the research director of B'Tselem was a friend of mine, Bassam Aid. And he left B'Tselem because when he found that there were Palestinians killing Palestinians, B'Tselem didn't want to write about it. So he said, I'm interested in saving lives. I'm not interested in making bad press. So he left. But there's only one way to deal with this. So Charles and I were discussing it in general. When you have an infection, one of the best things to do is to explode, expose it to light. When you expose the dirt to light, you can see where the dirt is and you can get rid of the bacteria. When somebody says something stupid, foul, expose it to light. 
and especially if you do it with humor, that works very well. When somebody says, oh, Arafat's a great guy, or Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, Uncle Abu Mazen, is a great guy. I mean, Abu Mazen is a nickname in Arabic. It's the lahak, it's the kunya. It's like calling Joseph Stalin Uncle Joe. And they call him Abu Mazen. Oh, Abu Mazen, come here, Abu Mazen, that kind of stuff. Take his latest speech, take a video of him calling for the use of rifles against Israel in a talk to Hamas and show them. That's not moderation. That's what you have to do. One second, one second. You ended your talk by saying that the way to overcome this is by uh, educating people at the high school level, at the college level. But if the educators are dominated by the people who espouse these idiocies, how do you get there? You have to start somewhere. I was in California this week, and people were telling me what's going on in their high schools, what kids are being asked to read as their world history readers. You have to go to your local board and you say, excuse me, this is stupidity. Excuse me, this is a lie. Are you familiar with the Newton High School situation? No, I'm not. But I'll, I'll tell you, this situation repeats itself all over the United States. It repeats itself in Canada, in Europe. There are schools in Britain where they don't teach the Holocaust anymore because they don't want to offend Muslim students. You have to come up and make a big stink. They will make a big stink if you even say the word Islam. Let's say you didn't pronounce it right. Islam. You know, they'll start to slam you for slamming Islam, you know? Or slime you for sliming Islam. And you'll always be on the defensive. The biggest offense is not to be willing to give offense to terrorists. Go after them. Go after their supporters. Tyrants always start this way. Hitler could not have achieved what he achieved if he hadn't first done a brainwashing of people and dehumanized whole populations. You have to fight back. You have to yell. You have to write op-eds. You have to embarrass people for their stupidity. It doesn't matter if it's the New York Times or the LA Times, Newton, Massachusetts. I don't care where it is. Embarrass the hell out of them. Use local TV. Make fun of them. Show them to be bad and foul and stupid. And when you do that, you'll succeed. Sir. Thank you very much for your very penetrating presentation. I have two quick questions. First. To what extent do you think that the United Nations is responsible for the attitudes of some people in the press and the academia and perhaps some of the government that we've been talking about? The second question is, when you were talk, referring to the New York City Police Force, when did you mean them alone or did you mean the joint task force between the police and the FBI and counterterrorism? Well, there are people who are good people at the FBI, but again, the best are at the NYPD. They really are super. They are, I've read some of their reports, some of their studies. They are cutting edge. Part of the problem at the FBI is that the FBI, the FBI should be the cutting edge. But the FBI is still thinking legalistically. And it, the FBI is under the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice is the Attorney General. And you're always going to have that problem at the FBI. Remember also that in the United States, ever since the 1970s, because of what Nixon did in Watergate, you're having intelligence oversight of agencies like the FBI and the CIA, and rightfully so, but this is often turned into a political football. If you watch some of the senators and a few of the representatives who handled this issue in recent years, you can see this. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. They, they muzzle, they censor reports. There's a Senator uh, Carl Levin who's been responsible for some of this. There's also Patrick Leahy. Done some horrible, horrible things in hearings. Very bad stuff. It shouldn't, shouldn't happen. And on the other hand, you have some very courageous people 
like the congressman from Long Island. Um, King. What's his name? Peter King. Peter King, who went against the wishes of his own party leadership and did some very important investigating. So I'm very happy for what's happened here in New York, but you know why? We've had buildings fall on our heads here. What happened in 2001 was a replay, to a certain extent, of what happened in 1993. And what happened in 1993 could have been prevented, because the person, the people who attacked the World Trade Center in 1993 were the cell of Sheikh Omar Abdurrahman. And a member of that cell was captured three years earlier. His name was Asayed Nusel. He killed Mayor Kahana. And in his apartment, they found 15 boxes of materials. And yet the FBI didn't do diddly. Immigration and nationaliza naturalization didn't do anything. The stuff was filed away. Mayor Dinkins said it was a lone gunman and all kinds of stuff like that. And after 93, the people at CIA and FBI said these were ad hoc terrorists. Well, if the bomb had been a few feet over to the left or over to the right, it might have cut the major support beam at the World Trade Center, and one building would have fallen into another, and 50,000 people, God forbid, would have died in five minutes, not 3,000. Think about that. Thank you very much. My second question you can answer. Oh, the UN. UN. I want to get a drink. Somebody <laughs> bring me a pina colada. Oh, uh, <clears throat> um, I don't think that the UN is the major reason for, for anything. I think the UN is a place that people go to be corrupt. <laughs> And uh, when they have uh, food for peace and all these other things, it's a way for Saddam Hussein basically to send money to Kofi Annan and, and others. I don't really think that that's what moves the press to do anything. That's, and uh, and academia? I'm just, huh? Academia? Academia is very much responsible. But you'll see it in my book. I, I, give you all the, I dot all the I's and cross all the T's. And I just want to say Shabbat Shalom because my feet are tired. Yeah. Good shot. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Michael very much um, and safe travels. And thank you all for coming. Have a good Shabbat. And also, okay. and also if you go to our website at www.isgap.com, you can see all the seminar series and the speakers we have. We have a very special lineup of uh, speakers in two weeks again in the New York area. And then we believe in mirages like Arab Spring, Arab moderation, and Islamic democracy. How is it that President Barack Obama and the Director of National Intelligence, <laughs> Lieutenant General James Clapper, who used to be the head of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency where I lectured, how is it that they seem to believe in the moderation of Syria, Bashar Assad, the moderation of Iran, the Ayatollahs, and, God help us, the Muslim Brotherhood? Jama'iyat al ikhwan al muslimun the Society of the Muslim Brothers, which is basically a throwback to the Wahhabi doctrines that came out of the Najd Plateau in Saudi Arabia two or three hundred years ago. How can they think that these people are <coughs> moderate? James Clapper appearing before Congress in 2011 was asked about the Muslim Brotherhood, and he said with a straight face, I'm not making this up. You can't make this up. With a straight face, they're largely moderate, largely secular, with franchises throughout the Middle East. He was talking about McDonald's, halal branch. <laughs> really? Really? Somebody who says something like that should be summarily dismissed for terminal <coughs> stupidity. And he's not the only one. So where do you get this kind of stuff from? How could anybody think that you send an ambassador to Bashar Assad and he's going to be a nice guy? Or that if you don't criticize the Iranian regime mowing down people in the streets of Tehran in a phony election, that they're going to be more moderate, they're going to be engaged. 
And how does somebody think that if you talk too much to Israel, they'll get upset in Syria or in Iran or someplace else and they won't want to talk to you as President of the United States? Well, this is a prejudice that's based on a variety of things. Arabism, Islamophilia, and good old-fashioned Jew hatred, which we sometimes call anti-Semitism. This sentiment, I hope that I have to stand right behind this. Is it all right if I take out the microphone and work? Yes. No, I can't. Funds. Um, so I'm going to leave a card at the tables uh, when I finish introducing Michael. And I'd be grateful if anybody is interested in donating some funds to help alleviate the costs of this event or others. I'd be grateful for, um, for your contribution. And if anybody would like to have more information about what we're doing, I'd be happy to uh, share that with you as well. Or you can speak to my colleague, Jenny, who's waving in the back. She's the coordinator of this gap, and um, she'd also be happy to speak with you. <coughs> and also, we have uh, books on sale. A special price at Amazon, they're $25, but here, special, they're $10. Um, and Michael will be happy to sign it if you're interested. And in five years, the signature will already be worth <laughs> <laughs> So uh, today, so, and, and the, the book here, as you can see from Simon & Schuster, is called Battle for Our Minds, Western Elites and the Terror Threat. And I read the book uh, almost a year ago now, and for nine months ago. It's a very important book. It's really, there are things happening uh, in our societies, in our institutions, um, that we really need to understand. Excuse and me, do you accept charge cards? No, we don't. Oh, maybe we do. Genuinely. Um, so it's a very important book. I urge you to read it. So it's an honor to have uh, Professor Michael Widlanski here with us. He's currently the Schusterman Visiting Professor at UC Irvine in California. He served as a advisor to the Israeli negotiating team, teams for various negotiations, including Madrid and Jordan and other places. He worked with the Strategic Affairs, uh, he was a Strategic Affairs Advisor for Israel's Ministry of Public Security. He has five degrees from Columbia University, the American University in Cairo, and Bar Ilan University, and he's the author of this very important book, Battle of Our Minds, Western Elites and the Terror Threat. Dr. Widlansky currently teaches at Bar Ilan University. He taught as well at Hebrew University for over two two decades. He was a visiting professor as well at Washington University in St. Louis. He taught at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and was a research fellow at the Shalem Center in Jerusalem. Uh, Michael has also been a reporter for the New York Times, the New York Daily News, the New York Post, Haaretz, the uh, Jerusalem Post, the National Review, and the he wrote for the New Republic. And he was the terrorist is interested in seizing one thing. He's not interested in territory. I guess I should take the mic and do one of these Perry Como, Frank Sinatra. <coughs> He's interested in seizing the territory between your ears. Once the terrorist can seize that territory, he's won. She's won. They've won. Because when you seize the territory between the ears, literally can lead somebody by the nose. The terrorist wants to induce a state of panic, confusion, and fear. I used to say it was like watching an Alfred Hitchcock movie, but today when I say that most people give me a blank stare and they say, who's Alfred Hitchcock? But some of you may still remember. The idea of the terrorist is not so much to induce casualties, to cause casualties, but to turn the entire society into a casualty. Basically, to take a democratic society, build on its fears and its weakness, destroy its faith in government, turn a government's policies around, or even to upend the entire society. That's why terrorism is the worst kind of crime. It is not like boosting somebody's car. It's not even like murdering a person, or even mass murder, 
because it is eventually interested in murdering an entire society. And that is why, when you're dealing with an Osama bin Laden, or a Hamas, or a Hezbollah, you don't play by the same rules that you use when you're fighting a kid who's 16, year old, 16 years old and is trying to steal a Corvette Stingray. It's not enough to capture one of them and then put him on trial. It's critically important to capture them before they do what they intend to do. That's why the legalistic approach of a lot of politicians is wrong. That's why in Israel we do not have that legalistic approach. We do not, we do not care about being politically correct. We make mistakes, and we have made mistakes, and we've made some recently, releasing terrorists. But generally speaking, Israel has the best record in the world in fighting terror. And countries that fight terror, which are democratic countries, Israel, the United States, France, Britain, Germany, India, Argentina, any country that fights terror has to ally itself with other countries that fight terror. Because ultimately, you're fighting a battle against the worst enemy on the planet. There's a whole other lecture that I give about the subject of why tyrants and terrorists tend to single out democratic countries, democratic societies, particularly Jews and Americans, Israel and America. I won't do that today. I'll do that some other time. But I want you to understand something. The terrorist thrives on finding the weakness in the democratic society. And the way to defeat the terrorist is to do to him or her what they are trying to do to us. Get into their heads. You cannot let them into that space between your ears. You have to be in that space between theirs. That means you have to have intelligence, as we say in Hebrew, kalte mashma, in both senses of the word. You have to be smart, and you have to be fast. Growing up in New York City, we used to say population was divided into two people, two kinds of people. The quick and the dead. That's the same thing with terrorists. Either you're aware and quick, or you can be dead, and your society can be dead. What happened on 9-11 was inexcusable. We had warnings. What happened to the World Trade Center in 1993 was also inexcusable. We had advanced warning. We had evidence. We had 15 cartons of evidence that the FBI didn't bother looking at. Fort Hood could have been prevented easily. The Boston Marathon Massacre could have been prevented. So how is it that America's intelligence is so often asleep? How is it that we get things wrong about the Middle East all the time. How is it that the Middle East uh, correspondent for the Cox News Agency and was a dipl diplomatic correspondent of Arab Affairs um, for Cox and for the Israeli television and Israeli Army Radio. So it's a pleasure to have you here today. You may not like what I say, so... Uh, <laughs> especially the optimists. Uh, but the most important thing is uh, to tell you the truth. And as soon as I find my lecture, I'll tell you the truth. Um, I could probably do it by heart, but it's more fun, it's more fun to look occasionally at the notes. How do I get out of this? Just a second. Okay. Well, I'm going to do it. Uh, 
start by asking you a basic question. What is terror? What is intelligence? And how are they connected? The most important thing to understand about terrorism is that the terrorist is not like the typical enemy. And terrorism is not like the typical form of warfare. In warfare, you're usually dealing with troops, with planes, with tanks, with the seizure of territory. When you're dealing with a terrorist, the terrorist is not interested in seizing territory. He's interested in seizing one thing, 